Hello and welcome to our second Startup Women webinar of 2023, How to Build Customer Trust with a Solemn Brand Strategy. I'm Isabel Nolan, the Acting Program Manager of the Startup Women and Startup Global Programs at Startup Canada. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am on today is located on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of all Indigenous peoples. I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge this traditional territory that you're residing on today. So you're very welcome uh, to uh, today's webinar. Um, I welcome you all to connect with each other in the chat. Uh, make sure you're sending your messages to everyone in the room. Uh, Zoom defaults it to only send to the hosts and the panelists. So just make sure that you're speaking to everyone. Um, today's session is being recorded and will be added to our YouTube channel and our Facebook page afterwards as a living resource. So a little bit about Startup Canada, if you're not familiar with us, we're a national nonprofit that's the gateway to Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're here to connect entrepreneurs with the support, community and tools that they need to build a successful business in Canada. Since launching in 2012, Startup Canada has grown to support more, more than 130,000 entrepreneurs annually and an ever-growing community of ecosystem partners from coast to coast to coast. The Startup Women program is one of our flagship programs offering um, support to early stage women identifying entrepreneurs across Canada through topic focused webinars, industry advisory circles and one on one meetings with startup women leaders. This is our second year running it, uh, this program annually and um, so it's allowing for us to have provide more uh, longer lasting support to women identifying entrepreneurs. Before we get started, I have a short message from one of our co-presenting partners, the Scotiabank Women Initiative. I'm going to go ahead and play that now. The Scotiabank Women Initiative is dedicated to your success on your terms. I'm shaping our industry's vision for the future. I can expand my business without borrowing from my family. I know I can face anything thanks to my network. I'm ready for my next chapter. I'm inspiring future leaders. I'm making sure my family's future is secure. Define your success and we'll help you achieve it with unbiased access to capital and tailored solutions, bespoke specialized education, and holistic advisory services and mentorship. Join our community of women today, the Scotiabank Women Initiative. There you go. I can see everyone again. Um, also like to thank our other co-presenting partners, UPS, our program partners, EDC and MasterCard, and our community of ecosystem partners, including BDC, North Forge, Invest Ottawa, WEC, The Sheepreneur Project, Northumberland uh, Community Futures Development Corporation, and uh, WEAP. So today's conversation is all focused on what goes into building a confident and authentic brand that will stand out from the crowd and earn the trust of your customer base. We'll discuss exactly what a brand is, how do you go about identifying the values you'll, you'll bring um, to, to form your brand, um, and how to set clear and measurable goals for your brand and uh, the power of harnessing your customer's experience. We've prepared some questions for our wonderful panelists. However, if you do have any questions, you can go ahead and put that into the Q&A box in the, uh, the bottom menu uh, bar function on your screen and we'll do our best to answer it live. So without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our speakers today. Ju Finley, brand and social strategist, Krista Halliday, CEO and managing director at Ray Management Group, and Mia Scop Scopoletti, an MBA and MA director and of brand at Export Development Canada. So welcome speakers and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Alrighty, so um, maybe I'll have you each do a quick introductions of yourselves. I know we just kind of listed off your names, um, but uh, maybe just a quick few sentences about yourself and uh, your background. June, I'll start off with you. Yeah, for sure. Hi, everyone. My name is June. 
Um, I am at my core, I'm a writer. That's what's gotten me to do everything I've gotten to do. Um, but I have used that to parlay that into a social media marketing career, a content marketing career, freelance writing. Um, and currently I also teach at George Brown. I actually teach brand strategy. So this is quite perfect for this, <laughs> for this session. Um, and I also am the director of marketing at Lollyware, which is a biotech company based in the U.S., um, but I also still, I still love consulting and helping out small business owners, especially if they're women. Um, and so I have, I started Little Kernel Communications about five years ago uh, to do mostly content marketing and help people out with that because it's still the Wild West out there. So that is, I'm a multi-hyphenate, as they say. Really great TED Talk if you haven't uh, um, heard of that one. But yes, that's me in a nutshell. Multi-hyphenated, I love that. <laughs> Maria, over to you. So hi everyone, my name is Maria Scopoliti. I am, as uh, Isabel said, the Director of Brand at Export Development Canada. So Export Development Canada helps Canadian companies to enter new markets and reduce the financial risk when doing so, so that they can grow their business and achieve impact in global markets. And, um, you know, one of our, one of our big pillars here at EDC is inclusive trade. So I've had the opportunity to support the inclusive trade team in their marketing and communications efforts. And about a little bit about me, my background is in marketing and communications. I've done work on, on both sides, uh, content strategy, social media. Um, I previously worked at the University of Ottawa in education and uh, had an opportunity to work also abroad in Europe. So lots of uh, good things to bring to the table and really excited to, to meet with everybody today and to connect with, uh, with the rest of the panel. Thank you, Maria and Krista. Hi, I'm Krista Halliday, CEO of Ray Management Group. My um, expertise is in sales, marketing and branding. I've been doing this for 15 plus years primarily across the mass retail market um, in Canada and in the US. I am also a small business owner um, with a preschool licensed for 50 children and a uh, small women's boutique. So I understand um, brands at a mass strategy level as well as at startups and um, small businesses. Wonderful. Thank you uh, for introducing yourselves. And yeah, we're delighted to have you uh, joining and um, sharing all of your wealth of knowledge and expertise with our attendees today. So I'd love to start off really by defining what defining what a brand is um, and, and what are some of the misconceptions that people hold about what a brand is or, or is not. Um, June, can I go to you first to kick us off with that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so from my personal point of view, it is what makes you different, what makes you stand out. Um, but in my brand strategy class, I actually came across one of my favorite definitions of what a brand is. It's from Marty Neumeyer, who has a really great book. Um, and it's called it's called Zag. I would highly recommend that if you want to talk about brands. It's really, really good. It's very easy to read, like a lot of marketing books are, which is great. But his definition of a brand is what a customer's gut feeling is about a product, mm -hmm. service, or company. It's not necessarily what, it is what you put out in the world, but it's it's ultimately just as much what other people perceive it as because that's what makes the brands grow or deflate, depending on how you look at it. So um, I like, those are those would be my two simple definitions of what a brand is. Love that, thank you. And yeah, I, um, sorry, Zag was the name of the book. I mean, we'll check yes, it out. I will, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, amazing, thank you. <laughs> uh, Maria, how about yourself? Well, how would you define what a brand is or is not even? Um, so, I mean, I love Marty Neumeyer as well, but I mean, I think just to add to that definition, uh, you know, if you think of any interaction that you have with a company, like whether it's small or big, it's the sum of all of those interactions that defines the brand. So if you think of a retail store. It's in the story of their founders, where they source their apparel that they feature, what their stance is on ESG, how they interact with their communities, how helpful their employees are and what their storefront looks like. And then you go to their digital customer experience and every single touch point helps to define 
who they are and the perceptions that the customers have. So what they're giving off and, you know, like what people are taking away from that experience and how they will be perceived. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Right, Chris, anything to add to that? For sure. Um, I think we're all saying the same thing. And June, I love that book as well. And I'm going to layer on with a quote from, from Seth Godin, who's actually, the, the quote is the introduction to our website on Ray Management. And it really, I think, summarizes what we're all saying here. And a, a brand is a set of expectations, memories, stories, relationships that together account for a customer's decision to choose one product or service over another. And gone, I, and I also wanna say what a brand isn't. It, it's not a logo, it's not a tagline, it's not your colors. It's really ha a lifestyle and tapping into a certain demographic or your customer's lifestyle so that they choose you. Love that, thank you. Yeah. It's some, um... Great lessons there. Yeah, it's definitely it's from the sounds of it, there, like the perception of that your your customer base or have of you really. Um, and, and we'll go into a little bit about setting those expectations um, and perceptions a little bit. Um, but um, so if we go back into you know for these early stage entrepreneurs that are in the room today, um, what would what would you recommend as a step one for an entrepreneur who feels maybe their brand is underdeveloped or um, unclear. Um, Chris, maybe I'll hand it back to you. For sure. I think the most important thing, whether you're at the infancy of brand conception or you're well on your way, you need to always check back with your why. Why are you creating this brand, this product, this service, this company? And Following that, you should have a clear expectation of values and the values shouldn't be a long list. They should be a handful of values. So connect with your why, connect back with your values and those should be your guiding light. Um, and it usually helps solve or answer any problem you can face at whatever stage of, um, whatever stage you're in with your brand. Love that. Yeah, I, I always uh, have entrepreneurs go back to their why as well. I Even when I'm uh, organizing our programs uh, at the beginning or yeah, the, the end of the year, I go back to our missions and our values at Startup Canada and kind of help that navigate um, or set the path for our programs and how can we best um, support mm -hmm. the entrepreneurs. So it's, yeah, very important to go back to that why. Um, June, how about yourself? Any step one that you'd uh, recommend for entrepreneurs? Yeah, I, I I actually have the same answer as as Chris does. Start with your why. Why are you doing this at all? In fact, it's when I consult people, it's like that's one of my first questions is why should people care about what you're doing? It's kind of some people take it like kind of like, oh, but you know, you have to realize that, right? This is a business at the end of the day, and it'll save you a lot of heartache and maybe even money if you can figure that out. It's it saves you so much time and heartache to do that. But also I like to um think about what would um, and then uh, other than starting with your why is why would people tell a friend about what you do? Because mm -hmm. the best marketing is still word of mouth. Um, it leads to everything else. It will lead someone to go on social, to go to a website, to tell another friend, like word of mouth marketing is still one of the best organic marketing tactics, but getting mm -hmm. people energized about something is really having something about you or something mostly about you because really that's what it is it's really about you and then secondly what you do is what will energize someone to be like oh my gosh I just found the perfect accountant I just found the perfect I saw someone was a cake a cake decorator um I saw yeah was like who you know I saw a great writer you know there's tons of freelance you know as a freelance writer there's tons of us out there especially now that mm -hmm. The majority of is flooded with now now that the staff writers are being fired like there's a whole bunch of freelance writers out there what makes you different what makes something about what you're writing or your perspective different and that's really what you can hone on in as well as figuring out what your why is which is the most important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and maria anything to add to to june and Krista? yeah maybe i can build off like the finding your why is by like defining that as well. Like how can you simply define that why so that people can easily tell other people about the unique role that you can play in their lives. So what makes your product or your service unique and how can you improve their situation and 
is there a driving force or a trend in the market that can support you in telling your story? And, you know, uh, you think about some of like the apps that come out and there's, you know, dozens and dozens of them that are coming out every day. But I remember like when Blinkist ca came out, it was that app that summarizes like full length books in 15 minutes. And like, they just had a good story. Like rationally, I don't have the time to read full books. I just want the basic idea from them. And you want to be the most intelligent person in the room. And that's what they're selling as a value proposition. It's an emotional benefit of like, you know, feeling smart or feeling cultured. And then the driving force with the trend behind it is that people are busy, but there's always a desire to learn more and to gain a competitive edge. So you're playing into all of these different factors. So how can you define what you're doing so that you can carve out that place for yourself and connect it to your why? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely hearing, like, go back to your why if you're if you're stuck or feel like you know your your brand isn't isn't quite there yet. Um, clearly defining what your why is and, and going from there. Um, I wanted to add one thing to this, and this is something that I've learned most recently um, because when I started my career, I feel that things have changed when you're brand building in in a very drastic way, and. Um, Something that I've taken on is a most viable product. And that can be around a service, a product, whatever that is. It doesn't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It just needs to be well-defined and use that as your most viable product to get started and learn from it. You don't need to start um, on a mass large scale. You can start small. And there are a lot of learnings in, in that small start that'll help propel you forward and it'll help shape your definition of your brand. I love that. Yeah. Thank you, Krista. Um, so while we're kind of on that, you know, what is your why um, and kind of building from there, I'd love to um, discuss each of your own brands um, and, you know, what that why is and what the, the core values are that underpin each of your brands. Um, and how did you go about identifying these and establishing them during that process? Um, June, can I go to you first? Sure. Um, so I guess starting my business was a result of being, at that point, I had been in, in some form of marketing or social media or advertising for 10 years. Um, and I had learned, I had been, I've been in many industries from nonprofit to law to startup to government. Um, and I had seen a lot of different things on, on what was lacking, especially like I'd worked mostly with corporate clients, like most of my career, I've been working with mostly corporate clients, but I was also finding that a lot of startups, not even like startups, just like small businesses, but which were mostly women, by the way, um, they're the ones reaching out for help and knowing, knowing what I was doing for bigger corporations, they were like, Hey, you know, you must have some tips or tricks, or whatever else. I'm like, you have no idea how simple it is. Like, Everyone is just vibing out here. Even the corp the biggest corporations you see, they're figuring it out too. And so my thing is just like a, a few things with, um, you know, building my brand and also just being relatable, um, being being open to helping others. Um, very simplicity because social media is actually way more simple than most people think. <laughs> um, it's just more consistency that is the hard thing than actual like establishing things. Um, curiosity. I, I'm very curious in, in general, like most strategists have to be um, just, but I, I always have been just as a child, but I somehow managed to harness that into a business and a career. Um, accountability, because even like what Krista was saying, like with having a viable product, like you need to have an actual thing that people can believe in and invest in their time, whether it's time, money, whatever else, because if you, there's so many different tech companies, for example, that, you know, Uber has never made a profit even though it's it's a viable, somehow it's a viable business, but it's never turned a profit. I always like to tell people that people are like, what? Like, yeah, it's never turned a profit. Um, but in general, a lot of tech companies will go off of vibes and potential, but not an actual product or an actual service that can be perfect. I mean, look, look what happened with Elizabeth Holmes, right? So you have to be able to have those types of things, a viable product that people can believe in and also be accountable to it, to be explaining how it works, how you work, what your values are. People want to identify with you, but also being open to learning. I've always said with either with bigger clients or smaller clients, as long as you're open to learning, I'll work with you. If you come in with a spirit of like, okay, I'm absolutely right. Like you can be determined, be determined because I want that. 
But if you're just like, if you're not willing to change or mold anything about what you're doing, then no one can help you, never mind me. <laughs> so um, those are the things that I think I've just taken things from my career that I can, it's more like me giving free games to people. It's also why I love teaching and giving back because I'm just like, I guess maybe it's a millennial term, but it's like, yeah, we call it free game, basically like free advice um, of stuff that you can just share with people that will, it not, doesn't cost you anything. Um, but it really helps someone else up, right? Or you give a hand up, not a hand out. And I really believe in that just in my personal life. So I've, I've managed to challenge that into my business or even just any practice that I do, whether it's teaching or doing whatever else I'm doing. And just, I want to be able to help people out, but also being sustainable in that you help people help themselves because that's one major thing I learned from nonprofits is that you give handouts, people aren't going to help themselves or at least learn how to, you give a hand up, people are more willing to do that. And so- I, I found that in general, it's more just like, you know, those are the things that I have, I have between taking the things that I didn't like about the various industries I've worked in and then channeling into stuff that I want to help out in, or I'm interested in the project or I'm interested in the person I believe in their cause, or I just want to help them get started. Um, then that's all it is. And most times it's the most simple things that they're like, you had no idea how much you helped me. I was like, I just, this is what I learned 10 years ago. If, I, if it helps you out and helps you make some money, that's okay with me too, you know? So, uh, yeah. Love that. No, yeah, it's, it really is all just about knowledge sharing, like sharing different perspectives with people. Like they may not have thought about something that way. So yeah, building off of that experience that you've had is uh, I'm sure it's super valuable. Um, Maria, how about yourself with uh, with, with EDC? Um, and then also maybe you can go into, you know, are there any things that you would recommend founders to be to take into consideration when they're defining their their values and their principles so yeah for sure I think like when I first started at EDC like over six years ago and we kind of did an audit of the brand at the time because there was a desire to do this brand refresh because we didn't really have like a brand per se it was a, like a lot of different campaigns and market and things were a bit decentralized so we were looking for that that why and when you spoke with employees and when you spoke with customers like the the thing that got employees out of the bed at the bed their bed in the morning and come to work was the mandate of the organization so we are the organization that helps canadian businesses to grow beyond canada's borders by reducing the risks that they face when that they they get out there so Obviously our people play a massive role in how we're doing this. So when we look at the things that we value most, like the first thing is the passion that the people have for our customers. So it's interesting because at the time, like a lot of employees, like we're not even really, like we weren't having conversations about values and that came up when we did our brand audit. Um, so we ended up building our, like our brand positioning, our brand identity and all of that. And it's really, it was really well embedded in our marketing, but not as well embedded in our culture. And then like, we've gone on a journey over the past several years to connect the brand more closely to the culture. So that it's really part of our DNA and of like what we're doing and what, how we show up every day for our customers is really important because then you're bringing that into the customer experience. And, you know, as we said at the beginning of the call, the brand becomes about more than just the logo and the colors and the marketing campaigns. It really becomes about your values and the choices that you make. And then those choices that you make help to dictate your strategy. So the core values that we ended up landing on actually came after we did this brand refresh and um, our strategy for 2030. And the, like the first one was passion for customers and then integrity, inclusiveness, caring and sustainability. And, you know, we still have to acid test those values and make sure that we're living up to them every day and that we're making choices. So for a big organization, I think it's different because you're also facing, you know, the pressures uh, from, you know, the, like different industries and the public and everything like that. But though that's what actually makes you level up and, you know, continue to adapt your brand, because I really liked what Krista said about working in 
MVPs for like a small business that's developing your brand, but really every brand should be working in MVPs. It's not something that's going to, that you define it and it's static, it stays there. It's something that has to continue to grow as your customers change and as market perceptions change and as the needs of your customers change. And uh, um, I think like the challenge for us is to continue to grow with it while remaining true to who your brand is as an organization. Thank you. Uh, Tanya, uh, just put into the group, um, MVP is most viable product. It can also be used for a minimal viable product as mm -hmm. well, depending on the context. Um, but just to clarify that for you, uh, Maria, I really like that you brought in um, the company culture into the conversation as well, because I think that's really important as well as, you know, the, the brand isn't just about how you're being perceived from the outside looking in, but also from the inside as well of your company as well and ensuring that everyone's in line with what your values and what your missions are. And I think you'll, yeah. you'll be able to build a, a far stronger brand when your employees are behind it as well and they believe in it and they are true to that as well so uh, I, I really appreciated you bringing that in I, did, I hadn't even really thought of it that way as well and Krista anything to mm -hmm. to add to that um in terms of you know what are the core values that underpin your brand um, and and how did you go by identifying these when you were building out yours for sure um I can start with ray management why and um, understand your why is actually our number one value. And so what Ray Management does as a company is we work with brands at every stage in the Canadian market, US market, European market, and we bring them into the Canadian market and work to sell them and market them to mass retailers. So the Walmarts, the shoppers, drug marts, the Costco's of the world. And I've done this on some level throughout my entire career, and I struggled with um, my why working through other organizations um, and other brands before. And really, the why behind Ray Management Group is to do better and uh, bring better products into the marketplace. And um, the Canadian market is really unique when you look at retail on a global scale. Um, there's a lot of monopolies around brands. There's a lot of big companies that own shelves at retail who pay big dollars to be there. Um, and to the consumer who doesn't live or breathe in that world, they don't know that. And so I struggled with that um, growing up in this in this world of brands. And so I wanted to bring, bring better products and better brands to the market who really had strong values. And we, um, we have a very strict, I would say a profile that brands need to meet in order to work with us. And that's hard too, right? When you're a small business and you're just getting started to say no to people and services mm -hmm. and revenue is a really hard thing to do. But I think that if you are using your core values as that guiding light, the success will come. And being able to define what success is to you is also really key in um, moving forward. So understanding your why, our first uh, value. The second one is having ownership and integrity in everything you do, whether that's making a mistake and owning up to it, um, bring it in my case you know the brands that we're working with have integrity and they're meeting the values that we have um the third one is thinking creatively and creative doesn't necessarily have to be physically creative it can just be thinking outside of the box doing things differently just because it's been done one way before doesn't mean it needs to be done this way again um, constantly challenging the status quo challenging your teammates i'm always asking for feedback um, and the feedback i really want criticism because how do i grow if i if i don't know um, so i think thinking creative creatively is really key in both brand growth and professional growth, um, taking calculated risks, 
you need to take risks to move forward, but those risks should be calculated. You should always understand what's at stake, whether it's a dollar or a hundred thousand dollars, and are you willing to lose it? Um, and if you're okay with that, then you you move forward, and you really need to analyze all the risks you're associated with to feel comfortable in what you're doing. Um, and then last is create clarity and co collaboration. And that goes from your colleagues to your teammates to people that you just meet. Um, I think that's really important to speak clearly in what your intentions are for whatever you're doing and create co collaboration. I see that collaboration is really the next trend for marketing. Um, you'll, you'll probably see it when you look at certain brands, you know, this brand is partnering with this brand or they have this core collaboration on a collection. And I think that that is going to be the future of marketing. So um, creating these communities within communities is going um, to really help you grow. Thank you for all, for all of that, Chris. So definitely some um, really great lessons there. And I think you mentioned um uh, accountability and, and defining success for your brand which I definitely want to unpick a little bit more um shortly um but but thank you each for kind of bringing us through uh, the value of uh, the values of each of your brands um and kind of how you got there as well um and staying with that we have an attendee asking um they're struggling with their why and kind of getting to their why um I'm just going to read out what they've uh, written in here so they said my story is motivated by my years of collecting home decor and pretty fabrics and the need to do something with it. Um, I, I am starting a home staging company in rural farming area in Southwest Ontario. Um, June, I think I saw you typing something in, but I'm not sure if it was the same attendee, but I'll-, no, I'll someone else. Someone else, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, speakers, I'll, if, if anyone wants to jump onto that question, um, by all means. I'm just looking for where I can find that question, or maybe you can repeat the Q &A, it. The Q&A at the bottom, Krista. Q&A at the bottom. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And then it says anonymous I'm, attendee. I'm in the chats, so I think that's what's I mean, I'll not. take a stab at it while you look, Krista. I would say, like, that clearly you've already identified what you like to do, collecting home decor, pretty fabrics. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if you like to watch stuff like Selling Sunset, I know, guilty pleasure, or L'Agence, <laughs> which is, like, uh, a, a nice a way better French version of that um but either way like they have people that start with their why they really like real estate they're good at connections um which is a huge thing in real estate you have to be able to connect with people um because that's where you can get sales and get future clients whatever else um but you've already identified what you like which is great and you already identified what you need to do you need to do something with it now you have to sit down and you have to spend a lot of time doing this. This is not going to happen right away. You have to spend time and just write stuff out and journal and really just being like, why do I want to do this? What do I, what does success look like to me? Does it look like, um, do I get to stage how many houses a year? Do I get to work with a really cool real estate company that's local? Do I get to have really cool clients? Um, do I get to set my own hours? I don't know if you have a family, but if you do, um, does this fit with the priorities of my family needs? All these other things are things that you have to sit down and really think through. And I love, I mean, as a writer, obviously, but, you know, journaling and writing, actually writing it down really, really helps because you see it in front of you. It can be in your head the whole time, but for me, I need it to be, I'm still, I'm a very digital person, but I'm absolutely analog when it comes to this stuff. When I write, I have a bunch of notebooks right here on my desk. That's how I process stuff first is I will write it down, really look at it, think on it, meditate on it. And then just being like, okay, what feels right here? And you go on with that. And then you work to have a plan and strategy that can tie to various goals that can do all that. But you have to, that's really what starting with your why is, is because everything is based on that. If you're able to advertise based on your why, if you're able to write stuff based on your why, if you can tell somebody what your why is, that's that's a start, right? So that's what I would say. Thank you, June. Yeah, I think another uh, useful way of thinking about what is your why is like, what keeps you motivated? Like, why do you want to do Big this? Time. Big uh, time. Is another way, like, you, if that helps you to reframe it a little bit better, um, what keeps you motivated? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, all right, just kind of keeping an eye on time. Um, I have another question 
asking, um, that's from Felina, and they're asking, um, as a person with no marketing experience, curious as to how to communicate my true values through marketing um, and without them being distorted. How are we sure the consumer understands the message? Which, fantastic question. And I think it touches on the, how we're being perceived or how your brand is being perceived. Um, so great question. Um, again, I'll open it up. Maybe Maria or Krista, would you like to start first? Sure, I, I can I can take a pass at it. I think what June said, and I loved it, and I, I added a bit of something to, about that in the chat is really like drilling down on your narrative and writing and rewriting it and sharing it with people around you so you, that you're able to be very clear about it, I think is the first step before you do any type of marketing so that those key messages are all, always coming across. And then maybe you're looking at having different types of key messages for different audiences that you might have. So different kinds of audience profiles so that it doesn't get distorted because sometimes I feel like the creativity um, can come after that. Like people look at marketing and the first thing they think of, oh, I want it to be really creative and really exciting. But I think like making it simple and making it true to who you are is the most important thing. And that really comes from getting that, that story right first. And then once you have that story right, I really think that the next step is being able to say, okay, how can I talk about that on my website and tell my story? How can I talk about that on social media? Or if I'm like at an event or a trade show, what is my elevator pitch? And what are the things that are most important to me? And then what are the things that will be important to the people that I'm trying to reach as well? So like really working on that. Uh, narrative, those key messages, and then practicing delivering them. Practice them with people around you, with mentors, with other entrepreneurs, and uh, and and you'll get there. Because if you're passionate about it, it's it's it gets easier to talk about as well once you've articulated it. Yeah. I would love to just layer on to that um, and, and help streamline it a little. I think that it's super important to know your audience and, and who your demographic is because your messaging will vary based on who you're speaking to. It could be the same message, but speaking to one demographic versus another is going to be um drastically different. So honing in on who you want to speak to, who that demographic is, really understanding that demographic and then creating the messaging that works for them. Yeah, 200% with that. And that's one thing I, I have to teach a lot of people in general, even my students right now is that before you, like when you figure out tra channel strategy, which essentially was where you're picking what, you're, what, what medium you're using, because a lot of people like to be like, okay, I need to be on Instagram, TikTok. No, you need to figure out who your audience is, how you talk to them, and then you pick the channel or channels just to, uh, to start. <laughs> no, don't be everywhere. Um, that's just some free game right there. Um, even just all of that, just you have to match all of that stuff that Chris has said first, and then you match the channels to it. Because if you do it the other way around, you're not going to get it right. And you'll have to do it over and over and over again. But honestly, even big corporations do this. So don't feel bad if you do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I, uh, the Megan in the chat was asking about preferred platforms. And June just kind of answered it there. You need to know who your customer is and where they're going and kind of meet mm -hmm. them there and talk to them in a way that's, uh, yeah, that, that's an alignment. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I know we have about just under 20 minutes left. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about um, the kind of continue on the, on the perceived element of, of a brand um, and how like an, an audience um, it is perceiving your brand. Um, what would you say are some of the non-negotiables when it comes to a strong recognizable brand um and like you know is it into the website into the social media channels like we talked about um what what are some of those non-negotiables uh, for each of you do you know go to you first um audience for sure i need to know who i'm talking to um that is non-negotiable i mean at least for my my own consulting stuff because it's you know that's been from the jump it's mostly been 
women who run small businesses. I have helped male friends out too, but I'm finding that it, those are the ones who I'm talking to the most are, are women just through friends of friends and whatever else. Um, and so, But also those who are at more of the beginning of their journey than at the middle of it. Cause I'm finding that's where my niche is. That's where a lot of people are more receptive to things, whatever else. So it's more to the beginning or intermediate parts of their journey. Um, so that's, it, you know, I have to know who my audience is. Um, then I have to know, you know, what exactly am I doing? What am I offering? Because I can do so much. This is the problem of being a multi-hyphenate is that because you can do so much, a lot of people can start to take advantage of that and be like, okay, so you can do this, especially if you do social media. Oh my God, they want you to be like, I want you to write. I want you to graphic. I'm not a graphic designer. I have an eye for design. I love photography and I am a photographer for fun, but I am not like, that's not my job. <laughs> so you have to define what exactly your services are. Uh, and so for now they are copywriting their strategy. I, that's how I realized I really like strategy and I want to do more of that because I was the multi-hyphenate at work. I was like, Okay, okay. I, I can't do all this because most of the time you're a team of one, especially if you're in an ad agency, which mm -hmm. I was working at for five years. Um, so I wanted to really, I realized I love strategy. I wanted to figure out the big picture of things. So I redefined my business to be more of the strategy part and figuring out the why and working out all of the kinks in terms of the planning stages of it and then leaving it to you to do the execution. And I find that's where my strength is. And so you also have to define like defining boundaries. I always say this in therapy, whatever else, but you have to do this with your business too and figuring out what your niche is and what you're good at. And then we can, what you can charge because you're good at that thing so well that you can be better than anybody else at it. Um, then um, I would say for non-negotiable for brand in general, it's just again, staying true to who you are, why you're doing what you're doing and what makes you different from everybody else. As long as you, that's a non-negotiable, you have to, stay true to that because honestly everything else can change you can change your website you can change your social media backgrounds mm -hmm. you can change i have a sub stack that i use to like periodically write thoughts about various things um you can stop doing that or start it whatever else but all of that can change but what can't change is the core of what your business is who you're serving why you're doing it what your services are even how much you charge should change with the time i mean we're in inflation right now so everybody's every freelancer is up, upping their prices as they should um, but in general, what does not change is what you, what you offer, um, unless you have a skill set you want to change or whatever else, but all the starts with the why you can't negotiate on that because everything else can change brand colors, photography, all of mm -hmm. that. People will roll with that. It's fine. People have the attention spans of gnats. Nobody remembers what was posted two weeks ago on Instagram, <laughs> certainly not on TikTok. I don't remember that. And I'm on it every day. So it's just what, what can't change is why you started in the first place. Thank you, June. Um, and Maria and Krista, any other non-negotiables for you that that go into a recognizable, strong brand? Krista, maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would add, because I think June had covered everything so well, is um, is some sort of partnership or connection to something that you're important, uh, that's important to you and your organization. To me, that's a non-negotiable. So uh, some sort of give back platform um, because there's, it, it's like a currency, right? Um, you need to give and take, give and take. And um, that's the energy in any business and in any major brand is to give back to whatever it is that is important to your company. And it should align back to your why and it should align back to your values. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, Maria, anything further to add? I mean, they both said it extremely well, but I think the common thread, I think in all of the discussion that we've been having around brand is like that, like your core value proposition, your core offering and making sure that it's crystal clear and expressed through everything you're doing and then connecting it back to your values because the choices like, for example, of groups that you want to partner with or support are going to be based on your offering and your values. So it's just making sure that those are crystal clear. I think it's just table stakes, right? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, with the time that we have left, I'd love to talk a little bit about um, once you've kind of built your brand out a little bit, now you want to sort of set more clear, measurable goals on 
defining, you know, if the brand is, is successful in some way. Um, so I, I, for each of our speakers, how do you each define success for your brand? And what are some key metrics or indicators that you use to measure the, the progress towards your goals? Um, Maria, maybe I can go to you first. So, I mean, for us, there's a, a lot of indicators because it, it is a large organization. So we do have a, like a brand health index, which a lot of smart, smaller companies would never have, but it it's like a, an, like a, basically a summary of five different indicators that show how well our brand is doing year to year. But if you look at a smaller organization, you would like look at how your campaigns are doing in market. So your like metrics on your website, how your campaigns are performing, how you're doing on social media, and then are these translating into business? Like, are they helping you to generate leads? Are they helping you to build relationships? And then what's working the most? And maybe you dial those things up versus things that, you know, might be helping you out, but are not actually like leading to ten tangible business leads. Um, so I, I, like, I think from, it's a little bit different for the organization that I'm in, but like for smaller businesses, you definitely want to be looking at all of those different metrics and how those metrics help to translate into business. I think it's also really important to hear from your customers because something that we haven't talked about as much maybe is delivering on the promises that you're making in your branding. So if you have really great branding out there and it's beautiful and you have a great story and all of that, but then you're not actually being able to deliver on a, a customer experience that you're promising in your marketing, then you're going to lose credibility and your, your customers are going to be like, okay, well, this is what they're putting out there, but that's not actually what they're delivering on. So making sure that you're collecting feedback from your customers, you know, having surveys, um, doing focus groups, like before you go to market so that you're really having that dialogue with customers, collecting insights from social media. That's something that, you know, like if you look at couple decades ago, it's, you couldn't get that kind of instantaneous feedback. And although some of it now is not always positive and there's spam and all of that, but like within that, there's also some good and it's leveraging those channels to collect the good. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Krista, how are you uh, defining and then measuring success? So for me um, and our business and, and what we do, understanding your why defines, helps to define the success of the brand. So for us, we want to do better. We want to bring better products. We want to be um, attached to brands that have strong core values that align with ours. So from a measuring perspective, are, are we doing those things? Are we being, bringing better brands to the shelf? The, you know, the answer is pretty straightforward. Yes. And then how do we help those brands continue to grow? How do we leverage the information that we're taking on and learning to build something greater um, and bigger? And of course, you know, everybody needs to also define success by a revenue goal, because unless you have um, huge backers that don't uh, care about the PL, which I've never come across before, you, you do need to set revenue targets and then how you're going to achieve those targets should be through your values. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you need to support growth through um, revenue. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. The, the, the bottom line is, is uh, pretty important, especially with, with, you know, their smaller businesses. June, how are you uh, uh, defining and uh, um... through the brands? Um, it depends on which role I'm doing. So if I'm doing my own business, um, if I'm working with an individual or a pair or whatever else, have I achieved what they've asked me to? Or have I advised them on what they think they want, but based on talking through them and listening, listening to them, and really being like, what is actually happening here and being able to deliver that information and whatever else, that plan to be able to help them succeed, is everyone satisfied? And not necessarily is everyone happy because sometimes you gotta give some people some hard truths. <laughs> That's unfortunate, it's not even, I've done it to CEOs and I've done it to small business owners. 
most people are understand. They may not be happy at first, but they understand eventually. Um, but for me, I'm like, was I able to help? Was I able to get them to get their their goals, their revenue goals, their KPIs, their social media goals, whatever else? Was I able to do that? When I teach, obviously, did my students pass? But not just that, because my students are like, we're in. I'm at the School of Design at George Brown, and it's a it's a newer program. It's only been around for five or six years. Um, I'm a part-time professor. So when I get to know my students, I try and be in communication with them because it's A, it's very small classes, but B, they're able to tell me what their learning style is, how they understand a certain subject, how they don't understand a certain subject, what they want out of it as much as what I want out of it. And so not only A, did they pass, but are they able to understand the concepts that we're learning together? Because most times this is stuff I learned during my master's, but I'm relearning again or teaching again, which is kind of a full circle moment for me in some cases, um, especially with the authors I did not like and then I have to teach them, which is hilarious, irony. irony. Um, but in general, are they going to come away with, because a lot of these students are going to be graphic designers, they're going to be in advertising. Um, am I giving them the tools that they need to succeed later on, whether it's their thesis degree or whatever else. If I feel like that's the case, that's success. But the KPI is understanding the concepts, understand, making sure you're, you know, you, the, the assignments are given properly, the instructors are given properly so that they understand so that they're able to do the job properly, right? Giving them a brief so that they're able to understand the brief and then let me evaluate it as I have instructed myself and them to, right? But then also if I'm at Lawyer right now, a big part of our thing is our brand because it was redefined last year. I came on in January. Um, and so my main thing is to really grow that brand from the stuff that we did last year. It's a lot of blue, it's a lot of black and white, but also it's really now, now it's like, it's been established, but now my job coming in is, has our voice been defined? We're still working on that. We're doing, we have a solid viable product. Yes, that we are now starting to proliferate in different ways that we're starting to find new channels and new customers to talk to. Which ones are they? What are we taking the learnings from? Especially if I'm running ad campaigns, if I'm running, I just came back from a trade show season in Europe. Are we able to just, are we able to be able to, what was the success of that? Were we able to make contact? Were we able to get people aware about what our new products are and what we're doing in the future? Will this lead to eventual funding? We're about to go into series A funding, right? And so it depends on the role I'm doing, but each one had its own set of KPIs, revenue goals, whatever else um, that really, that I have to adhere to, because as a strategist, you have to have a plan. <laughs> you need to have a plan to be able to evaluate, to know if you succeeded or not. Because it's not just about vibes and feelings and all that. I really like what Chris has said about the, the revenue goals. At the end of the day with this crowd, this is, we are running businesses. Like we have to, we want to make money at the end of the day, right? And so what are we doing to do that? Yes, it takes values and passion and grit and all of that stuff. But the real measure is, are you, even if you're not breaking even yet, are you on your way to doing that? Mm -hmm. What do you have to do to change your path to do that, right? Because this, unfortunately we live in a capitalist society. And so we have to measure <laughs> ourselves by that sometimes. But I think it's just as important as having brand values and all of that to be able to, match that with your revenue goals so that you're able to be like, okay, if this is happening, cool. If not, what do I need to do to adjust that? So for me, it depends on the role I'm playing, but each one has its own set of KPIs, key performance indicators, which as a strategist, I love. Thank you, June, for bringing me through each of the kind of the, the different hats that you wear and how you <laughs> go about each of them. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know, are there any brands that each of you see and admire for having a you know a a, a solid um sort of solid brand but also you know they've they've done a very good uh, job at also building that trust with their customer base um i'll throw it out anyone can go first um i realized that wasn't in my list of questions but i'm i'm curious to know if there's any any brands that you, you like i really love um telfar they are actually I should grab it. They're they're okay. So they're um, a black owned luxury brand that makes bags. That's what they do. Right. But what I've loved about them and I've actually used them in my classes and even work presentations, their brand is extremely strong because it all grew on social media. They only have a website to, to do video with user generated. It's all user generated content. They barely make their own content and almost everything they do is user generated content or UGC. Um, they've made themselves 
a kind of because with fashion in general, you know, luxury has gone up a lot, but a lot, not everybody can afford a Gucci bag or one of those small, like the small pillowed YSL bags, Gucci bags, whatever else. This is not necessarily something you can get at Winners or Marshalls, but it's in between in that it is a status symbol and that you're supporting a black owned business if you have it, but also that you're culturally sound because if you have one, you're like, oh, I see the tele like even when I'm, if I have mine, I'm going to class. Um, if I stop at a coffee shop, it's like, oh yeah, I see the telepod girl. I see what you're doing. And it's like, oh my God, they see it too. It's like a, it's like a huge club that you're a part of. Um, and so it's, they're very, very good at honing that brand and that like, it's a community there. I love their tagline too. It's called not for you for everyone, which is, I, which is so funny and actually ironic too, because it's luxury and these bags are a couple of hundred dollars US and they drop and they create exclusivity because they drop two times a week every week but they're gone within 30 minutes if you don't get it you got to wait for the next color whatever the drop which can be months in some cases and so between the exclusivity the exclusive um deals and all this stuff you can find on instagram they're mostly on instagram they are not anywhere on tiktok they're not anywhere else and for the most part they were only on instagram for a really long time um and then they have they don't advertise like they advertise mm -hmm. through word of mouth. That's been their thing through the whole time. So they have a viable product and service that people want, that people can identify with. They feel like they're part of something bigger. And the product that they have is a status symbol. Yes, they make clothes, but it's still the bag that everybody wants. It's called a Telfar. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, I managed to have two of them now. And I'm like, I feel special because even though like, if you can make a jaded marketer feel like she's part of something, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but in general, their, their strategy is excellent. And it has been for many years to the point where even in real life at New York fashion week, um, cause after they're based in New York, they have all colors of the rainbow in their collection. There is a store in Brooklyn called rainbow. That's been, I've been there. My family lives in Brooklyn. I've been there for years it's kind of like a, a really cultural icon of shopping, of shopping, uh, shopping centers. Um, and so because Telfar has a rainbow selection of bags and because of the rainbow store during New York Fashion Week, they had a sale of, you could get any bag for and as many as you wanted, which is, which never happens, right? And so it was the biggest event outside of New York Fashion Week. They made a bigger splash than most of the shows at Fashion Week made. And all they did was say, hey, show up here at this time. That's that's how culturally amazing they are and how tapped into people they are. Um, so I really, I, I love them as a brand in general, but also just, I've studied their marketing, especially social for years, and it's been fantastic. They're really tapped into things and really respond to it. And of course it blew up even more once Beyonce got a bag. And once she got one, you weren't able to get one for like six months. <laughs> yeah. Amazing, like, I just looked it up and I, I recognized the bag, but I've seen it in so many places that I didn't make the connection, so. Yeah. <laughs> Maria, how about yourself, a, a brand that you uh, you admire? Yeah, I'm I'm going to go with a small local brand that I really love. Uh, this shop um, in the center town of our city of Ottawa, I'm, I'm located in Ottawa, and it's called Vincent. And it's the shop that was opened by two sisters. And they are all about like carefully curated collections. And they, they travel across Canada and the U.S. and they fall, find like, uh, you know, small companies that they want to source their, their clothing from, and they, they have such a, a lovely story. And as part of their, their brand, they're, they're encouraging people to come into the store and to choose, um, you know, creativity over consumption in the sense of like, not to buy like lots in quantity, but rather to choose quality over quantity. So they have really good quality garments and everything. And then they give back to the community as well, like doing like clothing drives for, um, you know, people like underprivileged uh, women who are not able to have like blazers for job interviews and things like that. So they ask you to bring in like some quality garments and then they give you like a percentage off um, at several times a year so that you're able to buy something new but that you know your like gently used clothing can go to somebody else who can then use it for something um so they really they really are a part of their community the community they have like a beautiful store and the store really just reflects who they are they have a virtual storefront as well like they have like um a digital presence but they really focus on like being in the store and then when they can't be in the store they they sell 
uh, on their website, but like it's it's smaller. It's not as uh, like it. They don't uh, you know sell outside of the city and everything like that. But I just really admire like how they've always stayed true to themselves. Anything that they do um, outside of their core business is like always on brand, and they're just lovely people to 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 deal with as well. Like the customer service is amazing. So. Amazing, thank awesome. you. And thank you. I love brand that That's awesome. <laughs> Krista, really quick, a brand that you admire. Sure. I'm always uh, very impressed with brands who don't recreate the wheel, but change something small that has a big impact. And um, I'll, I'll use more of a global brand as an example, Glossier. It's a, a cosmetic company and they sell basic cosmetics at a great value. Um, they don't have this huge depth of product, very simple what you need, but what they did differently is they changed the cosmetic buying experience. You go into these beautiful pop-ups that are across the country and uh, you play with your products, you see what you like, and then they have this beautiful experience of the product being delivered down on um uh, I don't know what, what it's called, but on this machine that's coming down in this pink packaging, which is right on brand for them, their store is all pink. It's like, have a beautiful day and you get your product and you leave. And it, it's not about the product at all. Nobody necessarily cares about the, the gloss you're buying because they have it, it's a clear gloss. Their best-selling product is a clear lip gloss, which you can get anywhere. But people care about sharing in that experience with their friends, their colleagues, their family, and um, they've created a community around your basic mm -hmm. cosmetic shopping. So I find that super innovative and admirable. Absolutely, oh, yeah. Glossy too. I'm a glossier girl. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we have their uh, supply chain uh, director speaking at an event in, in October. So very much uh -huh. looking forward to delving into. And they're in <laughs> Sephora now. So I miss the, uh, I yeah. miss the which is, kind of takes away from the experience you're talking about. Because I used to work in New York part time and I would take orders from the girls in the office here and be like, I'm going, I'm going to Manhattan. Who wants what? Like it was that. Right. Like, okay, right. you're going. Yeah. I need to do that. Yeah. And that's actually a great point, June. You know, they are going to Sephora now, so they're changing that experience. But what I think is key there from a business perspective is the ability mm -hmm. to pivot. So COVID yeah. hit. Their pop-ups no longer worked. They were hemorrhaging money. And so they said, how can we take this product and this brand that we've created and pivot? And so what they did is they partnered with Sephora. If you walk in there and you look at their platform in, on shelf, it's very reflective of what you would see in store. It's smaller. It's obviously just um, a snippet of what you would get, but they have already built their clientele and they've already built their demographic. So now those people want that product as well, which is also very innovative and creative. So the importance of pivoting when things um, are out of your control is also key to success. Absolutely. Yeah. Great way to end the conversation. Thank you. Um, I know we're a little bit over time. So um, thank you to everyone that ha has stayed on for a few extra minutes. I have a very quick feedback poll I would love to get your feedback on how you enjoyed today's session um, but I want to give a massive thank you to our speakers June, Krista and Maria for donating your time your expertise and um, for your knowledge sharing all of the things and um, thank you all so much for for your time today and um, thank you to all of our partners as well for their support in uh, the Startup Women program and if you're interested in joining us for our next webinar that will be on um content marketing through storytelling. So another sort of side of, of branding and, and marketing with the small businesses. Um, so I'll put the link in the chat there if you're interested in joining, it's on July 26th. Um, but thank you all so much. I'll keep the poll up for a little bit longer, um, but enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you again soon.